obviously the declarations of interest, and that just falls for me to remind everyone that if there is anything now that they're aware of that is in any of the papers or anything that does uh, come up during the kind of proceedings and discussion and debate uh, that is uh, an interest that you will need to declare, please raise it accordingly and we can make sure all the uh, paperwork is completed um, in that way. Third item is the minutes of the last meeting. Um, can I move that the minutes of the last meeting held on the 28th of July be approved as a correct record if that's agreed? Excellent. I'll put my autograph in the book accordingly. And item four is the Mersey Ferry strategy update and Shane's uh, presentation report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the report in numbers is looking at uh, an update, the first update since the uh, original uh, strategy, first strategy, 20th strategy came uh, for approval in January of this year. Looking at uh, the background, some of the background to the issues. Uh, within section three of the report are uh, key interventions and the ones highlighted, shaded, are the ones which were reporting progress within this report. The report focuses on these key interventions. So looking through uh, part of those interventions, the first one looks at uh, uh, item 3.5 and that's looking at the new uh, passenger, 450 passenger carrying vessel, which within the strategy is tentatively planned for uh, implementation in terms of coming to operation in 2021. And the first part of that, which is detailed within item 3.5 and 3.6, is to commence some planning aspect for that. And so part of that is an uh, appointment of a naval architecture in order to start to present or some ideas to come back and undertake uh, these engagements with key stakeholders as part of a review in terms of the proposal and obviously uh, indicative costs. Now, within the strategy, original strategy, there was an indicative cost for that vessel, uh, and that was indicated around 7.5 million. Part of this work is to work through or start in the very process of working through that. The second intervention highlighted on the right, number three on the uh, table, and that's looking at the review of the existing fleet. And there are two key elements for that, and that in terms of the future of Royal Daffodil, currently it's in warm up at Duke Street, and Part of that is to look at the future of the vessels and how uh, they would be considered in terms of uh, implementation of the two vessels. So within the strategy, there's a, a vessel in 2021 and a vessel in 2031. So what the report does within sections uh, 3.7 through to uh, 3.10 is to set out some of the options or give some indication of some of the work that we've been doing on the Royal Daffodil that was surveyed in dry dock in May of this year, and any necessary reading the works were carried out, and that in effect will give it a delay of about a three year period. So one of the options in terms of uh, looking at the uh, second vessel, if that ultimately is, a, is approved as part of the strategy, is looking at the two options with the Royal Iris and Snowdrop, and we consider what vessel, which one of those vessels would be the one to seek to retain until the second vessel comes available in 2031. So it's looking at investing over a five or 10 year period. Within section 3.12, officers are recommending the retention of Snowdrop, and that's based on the fact that it has uh, less services in terms of, and, and it's got a detailed 24,000 uh, 24, hour refurgent later this calendar year as part of the vessel. And also the vessel itself is slightly different layout that may offer opportunities about maximising, if you like, uh, the use of that on the leisure industry side for that 10 year period before we acquire the new vessel that we uh, uh, set out in the strategy 2031. The next highlight point is uh, the Woodside Terminal. And within Woodside Terminal, when we originally came as part of the strategy presented in January, was to look at the option the strategy as presented was to look at whether the use of one or two terminals in the world. And the clear message was to, to go back and have some discussions, especially uh, some, with some of the uh, groups that had uh, raised some issues, say Woodside Ferry Group, etc. And meetings have been taking place uh, with officers uh, and, the, and the chair of this instance for discussions on what the options may be for that. At the current time, those discussions have started, they've been 
constructed today, but there, at this time, need further details to emerge before any sustainable long-term solution may emerge. But at the present time, the strategy is that we are doing remedial repairs of the landing stage at Woodside Authority, which allows for a three-year period for a conclusion of those uh, considerations to come forward. Clearly, the strategy itself had a challenge about minimising uh, uh, expenditure, and one aspect of that will be the long term, because if obviously that landing stage is maintained and that comes through as that option, obviously there will be a gap in some of the figures considered as part of the original strategy, because actually maintaining both landing stages has a considerable capital cost, which was detailed in that report. For completeness, under 3.19, Commercial negotiations have been going on with Don Energy. We have moved to Don Energy utilising a Seacom terminal, a Seacom landing stage, and that's due to the proximity of Don's proposed operational base within uh, the ferry site. But for completeness, that's covered inside the report. Item 7 is to look at commuter service start times, and the report indicates that there are some issues as to the current position in terms of current vessels requiring two to three hours of start-up time in winter months and looking at whether uh, the docking system uh, and the time and control, it's, because the docking system is controlled by appeal and can cause op operational uh, delays to services commencing due to uh, exit from the docking system. So officers are recommending that if we could revisit that aspect when the new vessel, the first new vessel uh, comes in as part of the fleet because those challenges of how to resolve that issue would be a little bit clearer about some of the capability of the new vessel in terms of either warming up or being uh, located within the docking system. Item 8 of the, uh, of the table on key interventions, that's looking at increased uh, river explorer frequency. And the, su the strategy suggested currently uh, hourly cruises to half hourly cruises during visit periods. What we're suggesting there is that we undertake some detailed surveys that we've commenced so that we have a better understanding of uh, the demand for that, and we're doing that through June, July, and September, so we get detailed passenger figures gathered in order to give, give a more informed decision about moving to that different frequency. Also within item 3.24 reports, obviously, the uh, disruption caused by the Manchester Ship Canal and the failure of the bridge, so the, the, uh, the, the collapse it affected obviously some of the services and some of the uh, services were run over that period. And obviously, the, the, what we have done is try to uh, bolster uh, other uh, services that we run, uh, more locally but not down the canal, because of the disruption by the inaccessibility due to the bridge. Obviously, that is clear, but that, that uh, resumption of that only occurred in the last few weeks. Um, within uh, section uh, 3.10, the uh, second intervention, sorry, uh, within, sorry, within section 3.25, uh, item 9 on the table, there was a review of fares, and uh, the, the, fare, the very uh, services fares are set annually by Mercy Travel, and that will be undertaken in, uh, usually in December of this year, and what this report will take account of within the strategy, the impacts of any fair amendments made by members in due course. I'd just like to highlight item 4.5, and it's really about the Program Management Office, because uh, now we've got a long-term strategy, we need to develop a detailed uh, program, and we're to monitor against that strategy, and work has started on that, but it's at the very early stages of that. Uh, but as we make any decisions, obviously that will impact on the Review. The intention is that we will have a program that allows us to plan for the interventions and also to commit to development work to allow us to make the decisions about the interventions that were set out in the strategy. It's a very brief one through, Chair, but I'm happy to take questions.
stage to my mind that we are doing what we were asked to do and we'll then come back with regular reports. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, um, thanks, Chair. Uh, just one point, something out in, in the report back uh, 3.14. Um, the word perhaps has been put in the, the sentence. Uh, I don't think the word perhaps was used in the resolution. some sort of a strategy on how we are going to increase the usage of these ferries and what our plan is uh, and have a look at that over that 20 year uh, strategy as well. Um, it, it, it just was a little bit thin for me on, on that side and I, I, would, I would be looking forward to seeing some sort of report coming back to this committee on that. Yes, I think it's a fair point on, on that side. These are the
so far, but there's a lot more we want to kind of understand as, as the opportunity of how potentially that could be one way of growing patronage, as well as other things around the potential of the charter market and how a new vessel and one that's kind of um, gives us a variety of flexibility.
I think some really important points um, raised there. Obviously, we've had some good engagement with stakeholders around Woodside, but there is still a lot more work to be done. So we need to all of those interested stakeholders to come forward with a variety of different plans and ideas and, and work with us on that. And I'm committed to continuing that dialogue and making sure uh, that that work stream uh, goes to its full potential. I also think one of the things that hasn't been mentioned, but I think is a real positive, as the shown pixel, is the potential of Dong Energy using Seacombe. Um, as a kind of landing stage for a lot of their vessels actually going out to the wind farms further out in Liverpool Bay. That really is part of a sustainable long-term approach um, to the, the terminals. It's great to see other parts of the maritime industry potentially uh, using some of our assets. And then finally, I think one of the bits that we're all excited about is a little bit later in the year when we do begin that process of commissioning a naval architect to look at the future of building a new Mersey ferry, which means we'll have all those opportunities in maintaining that very um, evocative and iconic Mersey ferries image, but getting all of those kind of key benefits, whether that's kind of better environmental sustainability, better operational kind of performance, and making sure it's all the kind of customer facilities that we want to see in terms of where it can sail to and how it can run, all the way through to the, the kind of other customer wellbeing elements, not just like accessibility, but all the other aspects of how we can accommodate the recording. So I think um, some, a few more exciting months ahead and we obviously look forward to, to further updates on the strategy, particularly with regard to the six monthly updates that we're um, obliged to give as part of the agreement of the strategy. So with all of that in mind, if I can move the recommendations in paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed. Yeah. Excellent. Item five is the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority Scrutiny Panel response to review of for transport and that's going to present the Thanks Chair. Um, all the material in the report is really in the two, um, the two appendices attached to it. So uh, those two are um, the scrutiny panels reports to combine authority from March and uh, the second is a uh, table which pulls out the recommendations contained within that report and puts alongside them um, the, the proposed uh, the proposed response to each of those recommendations. I'll turn to that table uh, in a few moments. Uh, just in terms of um, some background um, to this, just to refresh members' uh, memories, um, last year the scrutiny panel for the Command Authority embarked on a review of affordable transport, which was then focused in on short hop bus fares. Uh, the panel heard evidence from a number of different sources, so um, four different bus operators, uh, transport focus, and also a number of emergency travel officers. Those findings were pulled together in, in the report you see in uh, Appendix 1. I won't go through that in detail, but as I say, I'll return to the recommendations in a second. Uh, but one of the resolutions was to ask the committee to uh, consider the issues and the recommendations made and uh, prepare a formal response back to this through the committee, which is what this, um, this report concerns. Um, so the recommendations, they're broadly grouped into four different categories. So um, cost of fares, information about fares, uh, improved bus flow across the city region and future uh, opportunities around legislation. But I think as well, before I, I get into what each of those are and the proposed response, I think it's important to point out that the, uh, if you like, the context for these recommendations and the responses remains the alliance, the bus alliance being the principal uh, mechanism for delivery of bus strategy. Uh, while we undertake a wider review of uh, an assessment of our options, which will be available to uh, available through the bus services. Very briefly um, on each of the recommendations in, in Appendix 2. Firstly, the recommendations concerning cost of fares. First one, uh, a review of supported fares to analyse the costs and benefits of introducing uh, short distance fares and supported services. Turning briefly to the bus strategy in response, um, value for money and affordable ticketing uh, are key priorities contained within the bus strategy. And uh, what we propose here in terms of response is rather than uh, reviewing supported fares, which are 15% of, um, of the market, 
they actually undertake this exercise more broadly um, within the assessment of options in relation to the bus services bill. Uh, and we're about to we're about to start that um, that assessment of options. We're about to start that piece of work, uh, and that that um, that will take around two years to uh, to carry out in line with um, previous reports brought to uh, brought to the committee. Second um, recommendation is to continue to develop a range of tickets that includes an all operator car day ticket and other 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 innovations as well. Well, the introduction of an all operator car day ticket is part of um, the Walrus um, Smart Ticketing Program, and there are other um, innovations within that, such as the introduction of a, um, a one day ticket, which is valid, which will be valid on all um, all buses. And that Walrus program is is clearly um, closely aligned to the um, to the work of the Alliance. Uh, I'll take two recommendations um, together next. First, to raise through the Alliance a trial at Key Centre, which incorporates short distance fares. And the second, which is from a, the, the section around future opportunities around legislation, uh, progress on short distance trials to be shared amongst Alliance members uh, with a view to expanding trials um, if successful across the network. Very two closely aligned um, recommendations, so best taken together. There is already an example um, in the city region of short distance fare in the Southport area, so we um, propose in response to that recommendation to uh, raise the prospect of some uh, analysis of that on a bilateral basis with uh, Arima, the operator. But I think it's important to note that um, our ability to then discuss that more widely, either through the Alliance or through any kind of multi-operator forum, is quite limited really in terms of the competition law that applies, um, applies to buses. The next set of recommendations are around uh, information about fares. So firstly, um, the recommendation to ensure that emerging bus strategy includes information on fares as a key element. So since the um, scrutiny report was published, the bus strategy has been, um, has been approved. And obviously one of the strategy's key priorities is uh, concerns improving the customer experience off bus uh, with a clear objective of enhancing information provision to improve customer confidence. And that strategy also uh, emphasises how important digital and web communications and development are uh, to this. Again, I'll take the next two recommendations together to develop the Mercy Travel website and apps to incorporate fair information on points to point fares and the, to task the Alliance to develop points to point fares as part of the journey plan as a long term development. And there are a few different um, actions uh, being undertaken in respect of that or things happening in respect of that. Firstly, as part of the bus services bill, the open data uh, provisions will enable things like apps to be developed by third parties using open data, which will um, better meet customer demand both in terms of journey planning but also uh, in terms of fair information for those journeys. Uh, a refresh of the Emergency Travel website uh, is planned uh, for 2017. An element of that will be to uh, provide better information on, uh, on bus fares to, to customers. Uh, as part of the Alliance's ticketing work stream, um, a new Walrus web portal uh, will be developed and that will enable customers to purchase both operator and emergency travel tickets on the Walrus card online. And since the um, scrutiny committee uh, excuse me, panel, sorry, report was published. The even stage coach have also uh, undertaken some action to, um, to simplify their own fare structures uh, and provide a more consistent um, uh, approach to that. In the short term, that will enable um, more focus on promoting a, a more straightforward flat fare. Next recommendation is for the um, Alliance to develop a strategy with operators to publicise fares between centres by operator, and that includes um, looking at publishing fares in timetables in people shelters. So, Mersey Travel, what, what we, we do as officers, uh, we, we continue.
really raised with um, with operators the importance of value for money for uh, on fares. Um, as I've just mentioned, there are even stage coaches taking that action to um, to simplify their fare structures and introduce um, a, a flat fare uh, right across the um, across the Merseyside area. What that has done is for some people significantly reduce um, the cost of travel, particularly for people in uh, rural and St. Helens and parts of Sefton. But also um, what it's done is reduce the sheer number or sheer volume of different fares that are available as well. What that does, uh, it increases the, uh, the prospect or the ease, if you like, of uh, being able to promote um, fares. And we tend to take that forward as, a, as part of our customer growth work stream within the alliance. Next recommendation concerns improved bus flow um, across the city region and the recommendations to work with local authority partners to improve traffic management arrangements and improve punctuality and reliability. Again, we've got a few actions around, um, around that. Firstly, the best bus area. Um, it has been running for, um, for a number of years, remains in place, and its remit is very much to address issues of affecting punctuality and reliability. But it, the best bus area is only focused on, on part, of the, uh, part of the city region, so it's only a part of solution. Uh, the Alliance has a uh, punctuality and reliability work stream, and that's tasked with um, identify issues related to bus punctuality, coordinating the potential for improvement um, with the relevant highway authority, and then delivering schemes in conjunction with the highway uh, authority and with the districts. And also the um, approved key route network has been developed to very closely align with bus routes, and in particular the higher volume bus routes, and the lead officer uh, for the key route network for the city region also sits on our Alliance Programme Board, so that provides uh, a, a clear and important link between the Alliance's work and the key group network. And then lastly, um, recommendations around future opportunities, legislation and the buses bill. So the first of those is to continue to work transport focus um, to influence their work on ticketing and perceptions around value for money. The first thing to say around that is that, again, transport focus um, have a seat on, on our alliance board, their passenger directors agreed to, uh, to to take that up that seat. So again, this clear direct representation and facilitation of two-way communication through that with um, with transport focus. And we've just again um, finalised the um, the survey for um, that will happen this year, the transport focus survey, which again uh, assesses passengers' perception around uh, around value for money, and that's an important measure for, for us when we're looking at the progress that we're making with bus. Uh, next, the smaller operators should be encouraged to join the Alliance. Well, we absolutely uh, welcome that. Um, the voluntary partnership for, uh, agreement for the Alliance makes specific reference to other operators and smaller operators joining the Alliance. We've always believed that the strength of the Alliance will be more people more operators choosing to join and get behind uh, its aims and we're actively encouraging that in the meetings that we have with the smaller operators. We'll also be very careful to make sure that the barriers to entry, if you like, for the Alliance, the minimum standards that we expect are prohibitive to uh, smaller operators with different levels of resource. And finally, um, the, the progress of the buses bill uh, is kept under review and relevant consultations responded to. Uh, and relevant powers um, used around affordable fares. Well, we've been working very closely with the Department for Transport and Bus Services Bill has uh, been developed. Um, only recently this week, we've, we've been down for meetings this week where, with, with our lead official on the Bus Services Bill. We've also submitted evidence to the uh, Transport Select Committee um, who are reviewing the Bus Services Bill, and Frank's going to be um, representing the European Transport Group session. So we're, we're very, very close to that piece of work, very engaged in it. And as I've mentioned already, the options that will ultimately come out as part of that legislation for us as uh, a city region, those are going to be fully uh, assessed in line with previous uh, reports to the committee over the next two years uh, and in, um, in conjunction with the requirements of, uh, of the bus services bill and future recommendations.
great financial organization, professionalized operators to do things that they probably would never have done in the past, but are more willing to do in the future. Uh, and that, I think that's you know, where the creation should lie. Thanks again. Taxi and Liverpool City Council happy tire tables. Now, generally, as a rule, a hackney carriage will carry five persons, but 15% of the fleet in Liverpool carry six, six persons anyway. And there's no comparison since the driver said, all the fleet carries five, 15% carry six. So, you know, the price per head. Final point, and this one's a little bit. Evidence from Stagecoach, since 2005 to 6, Stagecoach has invested £500 million for 4,000 new buses. That makes the company look really good. It's been invested ever, all of this profit, back into it. How much of that is ground funded? How much is low emission funding? So I think deliver that. So how much of it comes from tax, tax revenue. If it's like the Asian taking over the train set, I put Pendolino trains on and say, you should want to drop this without us. They couldn't have derived a 500 million pound without tax money. So, figures would be nice to see how much you've actually come out of my, my money. Really, questions refer to the original CA scrutiny panel report. So, I am, although I gave evidence to that, I don't have a lot of the kind of the background to that. So, I think it's going to have to be something that that we come back to on. Um, I don't know the answers to <laughs> the three questions that you've asked. I'm afraid. Thanks, Matt. But obviously, we can get. Excellent report. I just want to turn around and say thank you very much to the scrutiny panel that's put a lot of hard work, obviously, into this and this authority. Um, but I do find it amazing when I look at some of these figures and I look at, you know, since the year 2000, the bus cost software has gone up 155%. I mean, that is, uh, that's then how it's policy, basically. Uh, and it's only because of the work that's gone on with the scrutiny committee and this this authority that started to curb that um, um, policy. Although, you know, 2.3% reduction doesn't go anywhere. I think that's just a little bit of a, uh, you know, them trying to play ball at the end. I would like to see that, that we as an authority strengthen, and I, I agree with Ron, uh, we, we need to get this written down on paper and written off as soon as possible so that we do have more control. Yes, they are. Uh, private uh, companies. We refranchise the roots, so we should have uh, some uh, pulling, try to curve this growth in, in fare increases. Um, I only see the dip in fares since last year because of the, the power that this authority has put in place in curbing that. And before the years before that, it's just been a free for all in fares. That, that only takes it out of the pocket of people in from poorer areas because the report goes on to say that the people that use the buses the most are normally from poorer areas, more affluent areas use cars. So it's coming out of the pocket.